Lord, we thank you that we've been able to sit round your table today and sense that you're with us. But we're conscious of those of our spiritual family who have been hindered from being with us, those who are sick, or some who have, Lord, circumstances have held them back from being here, and some be travelling. And Lord, we know that in spirit they would be with us in what we've done today, but we ask that you will touch them, particularly those who need healing, and uh, remember them all. Lord, and grant healing, strength, and goodness to them. And Lord, that we might serve you and have strength to serve you in the days ahead. And bless what we consider in Scripture today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 22. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted calf, fatted cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone that you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, How did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, Tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Well, we're going to consider this parable that Jesus told, and we'll give it a setting. It was in Jerusalem, and the following chapters, we've actually spoken about them in here before. It's where the religious leaders they have are militant to bring Jesus Christ down, and they begin by their schemes of asking him questions and riddles, uh, to trap him, and uh, it's it's in the last days in Jerusalem. So it, it's very pertinent what Jesus is saying when you see it in its setting, because obviously many of the parables were rightly interpreted by the religious people as being against them. And the Bible says the common people heard Jesus gladly, but some of the uncommon people did not hear them gladly. They were very angry, the people who reckoned themselves to be above others in their arrogance. And arrogance is a key in this parable. So we take the setting of it and we get the wedding feast of a king has prepared for his son. And right away, those of us who are Christians and who have the benefit of the whole Bible in our hands, we can look to Revelation and we can see the marriage feast of the Lamb almost uh, echoing down. Uh, something that we are looking forward to that day when the Lord consummates everything that he has redeemed to himself. We had a man here yesterday who was a fireman and he said that his job was to rescue people. And he worked all his working life rescuing people. And on odd occasion he said he rescued a cat up a tree. But he was rescuing people. And then he came to retirement and he realised something struck him that he himself needed rescued. And so he read the book of Revelation. No one instructed him. He, no one uh, he badgered him in a street corner. Although we do read about badgering in a street corner in this passage. And I like street corners. I think it's a great place to bring people to faith. But this man, just uh, of himself, read the book of Revelation. 
And when he got to the end of it, he was in fear of God. In fear of God because there is judgment. Uh, there is the great white throne. And he said when he got there, a great fear came on him. And he had faced fear and trepidation all his life. He had worked in dangerous situations. And he had known real fear, physical fear, uh, when he worked as a, a, as a firefighter. But he came to Christ and he found his fear was taken all away. The marriage feast of the Lamb. Praise God. But this parable, we have to take it as what it is, a parable. And it is a king. So it is someone who is at the top. It is not just a common uh, event. And it's for his son. So he sent out his servants with invitations. Invitations. Now I want to stop for a moment and say something very simple which I'm sure you understand but I don't think the world understands. There's a difference between an invitation and a ticket. There is a difference, a big difference between an invitation and a ticket. We were invited, we were at a wedding a Zuri went here, got, got married, and we were privileged to be invited to the wedding. And during COVID, we were invited to a few weddings, a couple of weddings. But because of the restrictions that our uh, present uh, 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 government in Scotland put upon us because of COVID for our own safety, the, the restrictions put on of it, and the, the wedding invitation was withdrawn. It was actually withdrawn because they couldn't allow us to attend. Uh, the numbers were not allowed. And so, although we had a kind of anticipation and looking forward to an event, it was actually withdrawn from us. Thank God when God makes an invitation, he doesn't withdraw his invitation. Uh, Jesus says that uh, whosoever will may come. And it's an invitation and the simple gospel is a simple gospel. Come, come to me, all ye who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, a ticket is something different. Uh, I mentioned in the notices that we'll be having uh, taking names to go in a coach to the BGEA event in June, and uh, it's an invitation. We don't pay for a ticket. It's free and for nothing. Free and for nothing. Because the people who are organising this event have no profit motive in mind. The only profit they are concerned about is that you might profit. For the Bible says, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? And these people who have been converted, who have experienced Christ and carry a burden... They have this, uh, put this event on that the gospel might be put out and invitations might come that people might attend to hear the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ which our present generation needs to hear again and again and again until they accept the invitation to come to Christ and be saved. Now a ticket is something different. When you buy a ticket, you are then... The, the person who sells the ticket is behoven to you. You can sue them. Literally sue them if you don't get what they promised you in the contract when you bought that ticket. There's lots of small print. You get to sit in a certain seat and if you don't get that seat, you can kick up a fuss. If the, the, the event that, that was offered to you was advertised and didn't meet your expectations, you can complain and demand your money back. And lots of people, when they're let down with tickets, we see the human nature in the raw when people are disappointed with what they paid for. But you know, an invitation is not a ticket. It's something that is paid for us. And it is something that is given with grace. The, the provision is given by the king. He's killed his fattest calf and he has uh, he's butchered his meat and it's going to be a banquet and he's calling 
those invited to come. But of course they don't come. And of course the echoes which the Jewish leaders would have recognised was that the servants who were sent out with the invitation, not only were they mistreated because they were refusing the invitation, they were snubbing the king, they were uh, belittling this son's wedding, and they had no time for the son, and of course we know that the son is the very person who's telling the parable, Jesus Christ himself. And so, these people actually put the messengers to death, and of course we know the, in the parable he's talking about the prophets, because God spoke to the Jewish nation through the prophets. The Bible says he came to his own, but his own received him not. But to as many as received him, he gave the power to become the sons of God, the sons and daughters of God, to all who would come. And we pray for the Jewish people today. We pray because they are in physical conflict. There's trouble in the land. But we pray for them because they have yet to have their eyes opened to the reality that their Messiah has come. They're waiting for him to come, but he's come, but they did not receive the invitation. Some of them did, and they began the first church in the very place where Jesus is telling the parable, in Jerusalem. From for out of Jerusalem to Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world, even across to Bergedi in Scotland, the gospel has come with the invitation. Whosoever will may come. And so this rejection of the prophets and God's Christ eh, results in the consequence is judgment. And when you read this parable, the judgment is final. It is final. The judgment is not a like the judgments that we have in this nation, where the, the only are meagre judgments, are half-hearted judgments, and a lot of the judgments are based on the fact that the person giving the judgment he is himself a sinner. And that is why, but God who is absolute gives an absolute judgment, and it is their total destruction. They could have been at the most joyous banquet in the pleasure of the king, recognizing the marriage of the son but instead they rebuffed it and they killed the messengers and hated them and poured scorn upon them for whatever reason they did it and so the, there is still things will still progress God's purposes will not be thwarted God will build his church if you ever look at the teachings of David Pawson who um he, who does great biblical studies, one of the main themes that he puts is, what is the Bible all about? What is the whole Bible all about? And he can see the theme, and you will see a theme tracing from Genesis right through to Revelation. He it says, it's all about God finding a bride for his son. That's what it's about. And ultimately, there will be those who, when this world is finished with, and the wicked have been destroyed and lost in, the, in hell, and the world has been re, re, renewed, there will be a group of people from the four corners of the earth who have been redeemed and made their garments clean in the blood of the Lamb, and they are the bride of Christ. And the whole Bible is about that story that out of the wickedness and the falling humanity that the whole this world uh, presents even today, you only need to read your newspaper, I know that many people buy newspapers nowadays, or listen to the news and the telly, and you will realise that this whole world is a fallen world, full of hatred and wickedness, even in high places. Intellectual wickedness. They speak with very smooth tongues, and they dress in very fine clothing, but they're capable of the most utmost wickedness and evil upon their own human species. But one day these people will be no more. The Bible says that the wicked eh, well, shall be turned into hell. And all those who forget God. Even in Scotland today, our nation makes no reference to God. When they, when they make very important decisions about how the society is to coexist with each other. They bypass any idea that God might have some input into it. 
But thank God, God's purposes will not be thwarted. And at the end of the day, there will be a people who will be the bride of Christ. And if we have not received that invitation uh, to uh, come and be part of that bride, we will be lost. Because that is all that is going to continue into eternity from this world. Everything else will pass away, the Bible says. Though we fold up the world like a garment and make a new world. He will have a bride, which is his church, which is his body. And we will be those redeemed who will be washed in the blood of Christ. So an invitation is not a ticket. A ticket is something that you earn with your efforts and with your money and with your resources. And some many people live like that. They feel they have an entitlement to go to heaven. You know that they say that going to church doesn't mean you're a Christian. It means you go to church. That's what going to church means. You go to church. Being a Christian means that you have received God's invitation of grace and mercy and you have turned from the sin, the thing that's blocking the way to you to God and allow God to remove it. Now some people think that they can remove their own sin by being better people and that's them buying their ticket to heaven, buying a ticket to heaven. They think that by doing good things they can uh, compensate for the bad things they've done. But in the Bible, that's not how it works. The Bible says that all of the iniquities on him were laid. He bore it all on the tree. The Bible says he became sin for us when Jesus died on the cross. He was making a way into heaven, paying for the sins of this lost humanity. He had uh, taken the judgment and then he rose from the dead and he could proclaim a gospel saying, listen, stop trying to buy your way to heaven with your good works. For the Bible says, all our righteousness is as filthy rags. There is none righteous, no, not one, but the Son of God, the perfect one who came, the second Adam, who never sinned. He alone, he alone, mark my words. Some people are saying all religions lead to heaven. The Bible doesn't say that. God's word, and we must ultimately submit to what God says, not what people are saying or thinking or what is uh, convenient to believe in a mixed-up society. Through all the mess of life, we say, God, what are you saying? And God says, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He is our invitation to heaven. Not our works. If you're a Roman Catholic, they'll say you'll get to heaven by your seven, keeping the seven sacraments. That's you buying your ticket to get into heaven. You don't buy your ticket by doing good works. For none of us are good enough. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, not, no, not one. Only Christ has paid the price for our sins. So it's an invitation that he from his side removes the block. He takes away the sin to all who recognize it, turn from it and cry upon him for mercy and receive his invitation to life. And he does say that, that he will give us life and life eternal. And so we see a strange thing. This parable could stop at that. Eh, that these people, they go out to the highways and the byways and the street corners and eh, it shows you Almost uh, which uh, uh, resonates with my heart, the evangelist at work. Whosoever will may come, the Bible says. It says that in Isaiah the prophet. Come, drink from the wells of salvation. He who has no money, come and drink freely of the wells of salvation. So those who have nothing to offer God. For it said, bring in the good and the bad. It says it here in the Bible. Bring in the good and the bad. It doesn't matter what your standing is. Get them all in as long as you'll receive the invitation and come in according to what God has requested of them. And then there's a wee kind of bit at the end of this story which talks about this man. And it talks about this man 
who comes into the wedding feast and is amongst all of the guests. And the king comes in and what he deceives this man that there's something different about him. He's not got on a wedding garment. He's not got on a wedding garment. Now there's been a lot of speculation by the commentators to what this wedding garment is all about. One commentator uh, refers to some tradition that the, possibly the king, and with the invitation, supplied them with a garment that they might all wear because his wealth knew no bounds and this was the most uh, luxurious feast there was. We don't know that. But we know that there was an expectation that everybody had a wedding garment. Of course, when we get to know the New Testament, we sing these wee songs, I am covered over with the robes of righteousness that Jesus gave to me. And when God looks on us, he doesn't see our filthy rags, but he sees the righteousness of Christ. And thank God at the wedding feast of the Lamb, when he looks upon us, he doesn't see uh, us as we wear, as what we, but he sees us overlaid with the righteousness of God. You know, I used to teach uh, religion in a school, and I found one of the things fascinating, if you study the Hajj, you know, that's a Muslim thing. Now, you don't uh, throw me stones for, I'm not preaching Islam, I'm just giving you an example here. When the Muslims go on the Hajj, to Mecca, and they all go a walk in, into the desert, and there's a stone there, they throw stones at this brick thing, say, say it's the devil, and they throw stones, they do all sorts of rites, a passage as they travel along. They're all issued with a white garment, and they don't wear their own, they don't bring their own clothing. Now, if you ever go on a holiday and you go to some kind of event, it's marked by people's finery. You know, the girls are all looking at everybody's dress and say, oh, isn't that beautiful? And they're looking at theirs and they're comparing whether they put on the right dress and men are uh, uh, getting their ties straightened and everybody's looking at everybody else through the lens of what they are presenting themselves in. But when these uh, Muslims go to the Hajj, they're only allowed to wear this simple white garment. So they're all marching down the road. Now one could be a street cleaner, and one could be a bank manager, and one could be just out of Berlin prison. You would never know what they are because they are not distinguished because they're covered over. And I think the Muslims probably got that from the wee bit of Christianity that is in their religion. Because you know there is a lot of the Christian faith is filtered in, and the Jewish faith, into Islam. It's peppered with it. It reminds me of a time I went to a, a, this fella came to visit me when I was a student in Dundee and he wanted to go to this a, Turkish bath. And I'd never been in a Turkish bath. He said, oh, there's a Turkish bath. He says, it's great. You feel great. So we went to this Turkish bath and it was a big kind of steam room thing. It was a really, I think it was a Victorian thing. You know what Dundee's like. They're still catching up with the rest of the world. And, it, and we're standing in this thing with towels on, and all these men are all standing, you know, fortunately it, it was segregated, of course, you know, it wasn't like a lot of these Scandinavian ones, but they're all in it together, it was the men and the women were away somewhere else, and we're all in this big steam room, and everybody, all you could see was a towel, and, we're all in the, and you suddenly realise that you couldn't distinguish who was the guy with all the money, and who was the pauper, and there was no way to distinguish them. They say that clothes make of the man. But no in a Turkish bath. But in the, the wedding feast of the Lamb, we're all one. We're dressed with a wedding garment. Dressed in the wedding garment. God makes us one in him. There's nobody eh, more equal than others. Put it that way. Who is it said all men are equal, but some are more equal than others. But in God's eyes, we are cleansed and purged and accepted at the wedding feast. But this guy came in and he didn't have on a wedding garment. Now how you get in, now the Bible says the thief doesn't comes in but to kill and destroy and some people try to get in the windows. Fortunately when you come to Christ you go through the door. If you've got an invitation you go through the door 
is you're not know, getting an invitation, you do what we, we, we did when we were wee boys up at the Regal Cinema. We used to go, somebody went in with a ticket, and then they would open the fire door to let you in. And if the wee guy caught you, you get thrown out in your neck. Some people come in, but they shouldn't be in. They've no right to be in. And the king says, friend, how did you get in without a wedding garment? Now, we don't know what the man was dressed in. He could have been dressed in his filthy rags. He could have stunk the high heaven. He could have been bringing down the tone of the event. Or he could have been the opposite. He could have thought the wedding garment is not good enough for me. And there are people like that in this world. A simple gospel is not good enough for me. And he might have come in with more elaborate fancy clothes. But that wasn't the point. They didn't come in and he had snubbed the king. He had showed contempt to the gospel. He did it as Frankie Vaughan sings at the funeral parlours. He did it his way. And doing it your way means you slip right into hell. And the funny thing was the man was free. He could have taken the invitation. He could have put on the wedding garment. But no, he came in his way. And the funny thing about the man is we realise his freedom is taken from him. How do we know that? For the Bible says, bind him hand and bind him foot. If you're bound hand and foot, you have no freedom anymore. And throw him out where there'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of tears. And all those people who expect to sail into heaven because they weren't a bad person. They came in their own garments, representing themselves to God as good enough, not any worse than anybody else. But that's not the point. The point is you didn't come God's way. You must be born again of the Spirit. You must repent of your sin. Except you be converted and become as little child, you shall in no wise enter in to the kingdom of heaven. So we have this wonderful, wonderful parable, which is speaking in its time to these Jewish leaders, reflecting on the past, that what they have done in killing all the prophets to protect their own religiosity and their own powerful position before men. Because everything the Pharisees did and the teachers of the law and the Sanhedrin was all before men. And everything organized religion does is before men. But when somebody becomes a Christian, it's before God Almighty. Hallelujah that we can take this gospel. Let's take this gospel to the highways and the byways, to the street corners. A good street corner is a good place because you get them coming in both directions. Amen. If you stand in the middle of the street, you know, but a street corner is a great place. So let's say trust God for the freedom and for the invitation and that the king has called us to his wedding feast. The, la- the, the wedding feast of the Lamb. And if you're not a Christian, if you've maybe been thinking wrongly for many years that God lets you into heaven because of your church affiliation or your family connections or the fact that you're a kind and good person, then today is the day to say, Lord, I'm sorry. I've got it all wrong. I want my sins forgiven. I want to know with certainty that I'm going to be allowed in and I will not be left out where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Praise God. We're going to come and sing our closing hymn now, which is uh, All for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be.
Yeah.